as I explained in the last video, it's the liver's job to uh, kind of control um, whenever your blood sugar gets low. It, it's the job of the liver to basically add more blood to, or add more glucose to the blood. So here's your liver, and inside this liver we, we have um, a bunch of substrates that are being converted into glucose 6-phosphate. And in order to get out of the liver, they have to be converted into glucose. So glucose 6-phosphate can't be transported out of a cell. It has to be converted to glucose, and then that glucose can be sent to other organs like your brain. And I'm not really good at drawing a brain or a liver, but that's, uh, this is your liver. This is your brain. So when you're low on blood sugar, your pancreas will produce glucagon. Glucagon. And glucagon will act on the liver to tell it to uh, perform two things. It says, first gluconeogenesis, or actually first is glycogenolysis. Glyco glycogenolysis. Breaks down glycogen stores and turns that into glucose. And the second one is gluconeogenesis. So gluconeogenesis, and you can actually uh, convert amino acids into sugars. But as I explained earlier, with uh, glycogen storage disease one or von Goerck's, you have two types. You so here's our we're going to call this our cell membrane, and then we're going to say that this is the endoplasmic reticulum, and there's a T1 transporter, and uh, we'll say a T2. That's T2, and then T. 3 transporter. And so glucose 6-phosphate, glucose 6-phosphate is supposed to go in here and then this enzyme, this is glucose 6-phosphatase, converts it into glucose and then it goes out the T3, the phosphate, phosphate comes out here, glucose comes out here. Now, in, in uh, glycogen storage disease type 1, two things could be wrong. So this transporter could be broken and glucose 6-phosphate can't get to the enzyme or the enzyme could be broken and even though it got to the enzyme it couldn't be converted into glucose. So when we break down our glycogen it just stays as glucose 6-phosphate and doesn't do anything. And so the blood sugar remains perpetually low. Now this will have a couple of effects. So first of all, um, your your uh, amino acids will try to make up for it. So you'll start breaking down amino acids in order to create energy um, and through gluconeogenesis, because your body will sense, oh, there's no sugar. The blood sugar keeps falling. Maybe the liver is out of uh, glycogen, so it'll start breaking down amino acids and still amino acids will get converted into glucose 6-phosphate and yet nothing will happen because it can't be converted back into glucose to leave the cell. Another thing that will happen is uh, your, uh, your muscle cells for instance whenever you have two ADPs so I have an ADP and an ADP uh, your muscles will say, dang, I'm really low on energy. It'll steal one of the phosphate groups off of here and add it to here. So you'll get AMP and ATP. So it's, it's uh, basically where it could have made two ATPs if glucose would have been available. It instead gives up the right to make that second one in order to make just one ATP. Now AMP gets depurinated. Depurinated. And, and then the depurinated AMP uh, produces uric acid. And so under extreme uh, glucose uh, deficiency and under extreme oxygen debt, uh, your, your muscles start producing uric acid, and that will get into your blood, and you'll get uh, acidosis. But before the acid, so we got two symptoms at this point. We have... Um, the first one is uh, we have hypoglycemia, and the second one is acidosis. So um, the hypoglycemia, of course, is the low blood sugar. The acidosis is from the uh, uric acid going into the into the blood. 
Now, before I forget, there's another source of acidosis. So the acidosis doesn't just come from the uric acid, it also comes from lactic acid. So in, in the muscles, your muscles use up glucose, and uh, whenever you run out, when you're running low on oxygen, um, it will go from, it'll go to pyruvate, and then the pyruvate will go through anaerobic metabolism to form lactate or lactic acid, lactate slash lactic acid. I'll just put LA. And so that's another source of acidosis. So that lactate gets sent to the liver, and uh, the liver tries to convert that back into um, pyruvate and then gluconeogenesis back into glucose. But in our case, we're stuck again. So we have a buildup of lactic acid in the blood, and we have a buildup of uric acid. Now, the body would also wouldn't mind using fats for energy. So uh, that is an, an attempt. Well, typically, so you have um, uh, basically uh, glycerol, glycerol, and, and it will be converted into glycerol 3 phosphate, glycerol 3 phosphate, and then that gets converted into dihydroxyacetone dihydroxyacetone and then dihydroxyacetone can go through one of two pathways it can it can be converted into uh, glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate this is if the cell that it's in glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate this would be if the cell that it was in needed more energy in this case it's in the liver it doesn't need more energy so it would be converted into fructose, so fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, bisphosphate, which if you remember the diagram, uh, fructose, we'll just do fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, it, it goes up and becomes, uh, through the gluconeogenic pathway, it becomes uh, glucose 6-phosphate. So we have a, a buildup of glucose 6-phosphate, so glycerol gets backed up. Now the metabolism of fatty acids, the first step is to break off a glycerol, so we'll call this fatty acid. Since, we can't, since we're backed up with glycerol now, we can't do that with any more fatty acids, and so you get a backup of fat, you get excess fatty acids in your liver. So everything's being backed up. Uh, the glycogen is backed up, the fatty acid metabolism is backed up, the gluconeogenesis uh, pathway for amino acids is all backed up, and so what you get is, so you, right now we're, we've got hyperglyce hypoglycemia, hypoglycemia, we've got uh, acidosis, and this is called metabolic acidosis, and then we have uh, all these things backed up in the liver, your liver is going to start becoming enlarged and you're going to have hepatomegaly, an enlarged liver. The body will try to compensate for the acidosis and what happens, so if you have an excess of hydrogen ions, so your body has, um, it, it, it keeps bicarbonate in the body at all times. So this is H3O minus and this is in equilibrium with uh, carbonic acid, H2CO3, or some, some would call it hydrogen bicarbonate. So these are in an equilibrium to maintain an acid-base balance. Now whenever you get uh, an increase in hydrogen ion, it drives uh, the bicarbonate into carbonic acid, and that carbonic acid then is in equilibrium with uh, H2O and CO2. So you're, you're creating an, an excess of CO2, and the CO2 uh, causes you to your increased breathing rate, and so you get uh, tachapnea, tach, tach or increased breathing. The increased breathing will actually cause you to blow off the excess CO2, and that will uh, help to, to keep the pH high. So... Uh, a low pH means you have a lot of hydrogen ions, and so you want to raise your pH to reduce the acidic environment. And so by blowing off excess CO2, you actually lower your bicarb levels, and you also lower your CO2 levels. 
Now, anytime the liver gets enlarged, well, not anytime, but most of the time when the liver gets enlarged, so you have, we're going to redraw our liver here. We have our liver, and it has a portal vein. It's called the portal vein going into it. And that portal vein goes off to the, it branches off to several different things. So you have the uh, vein coming from the stomach. And over here on the side of the stomach, we have the spleen, and you have this vein going off to the spleen. And now typically, whenever, and then you have uh, a portion going off to the mesentery, so the intestines. And um, all of it's flowing in this direction into the liver. So it's trying to return to the heart, but it flows through the liver. When the liver gets inflamed, it kind of closes down. It gives a backup of this vein, and you get a, your uh, spleen starts to swell up. But there's actually another cause for, uh, uh, for splenomegaly. So we, we're going to see splenomegaly. So that would be number five, splenomegaly. But that cause is only one of, of two causes. So um, also whenever you have a uh, glycogen storage disease, especially glycogen storage disease 1B, uh, which is a problem with the translocase 1 and not the enzyme itself, it, it, has a, it, it causes neutropenia. And I, I, I'm not going to go through the exact um, pathophysiology of that, but it causes low neutrophils. Now the spleen is responsible for, um, for maturing neutrophils, and so you, whenever you don't have the neutrophils maturing properly, you have uh, a bunch of activity going on in the spleen, and it's basically spinning its wheels. So you're going to get neutropenia, and usually that will also contribute to the splenomegaly. Now, whenever you have, neutrophils are your body's first defense to a disease. So a lot of times, um, you're going to see a comorbidity, some, some type of other disease that uh, is, would typically look unrelated, but it's not. So like a sore throat or an ear infection. So we're just going to write infection, possibly. Not, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty likely. So infection. And now that's basically the clinical presentation, but you get a blood panel. Um, because of the metabolic acidosis, you would expect to see low bicarb because you're blowing off CO2. Low bicarb. You would expect to see extremely low glucose. Glucose. And uh, the liver enzymes. So we're going to say liver enzymes, which includes uh, ALT, AST, LDH, um, you might check uric acid and lactic acid. All these would be on a liver panel and you would expect all of this to be high. Uh, actually, yeah, everything in here would be high and that's because um, some liver with liver damage these enzymes are going to leak out into the blood and ALT is a key enzyme because it's specific to the liver whereas AST can be found in uh, cardio, uh, myocardial cells that can be found in red blood cells and other things as well. So a uh, high ALT would be a key indicator that the liver has uh, got something wrong with it. So the last step in, in diagnosing, a, well not the last step, but one of the next clinical steps would, uh, you would want to say, okay, well let's first, the first thing you want to do is let's get this guy some glucose. So let's get well, some dextrose glucose. We want to get him some some sugar in his blood because he's hypoglycemic. He's probably and so hypoglycemia. Uh, you're probably going to see either confusion, um, irritability. I'll just put ir irritability, uh, and possibly if the blood sugar is low enough, you could see coma, some type of coma. It's a hypo uh, hypoglycemia hypoglycemic cause. Whenever your brain gets below like 20, um, you your brain tells everything else, shut down, I'm conserving all the sugar for myself. And the, your patient will be unresponsive. So you want to administer some, some dextrose. And if the patient uh, starts feeling better automatically, you know, okay, there, this coma or irritability or confusion was from the lack of sugar in the blood, which is possible, most likely the case. And then the next thing you could do is uh, you could um, inject some intramuscular glucagon. And you would expect that to have a 
positive increase on blood glucose. And if it didn't, at that point, you would want to you would suspect some type of glycogen storage disease, and you just simply sequence um, the genes involved in glycogen storage disease and see which type it is. So you do a gene. So you just do um, some genetic testing. And so one of the principles is whenever you have uh, a blood sugar problem, especially if it's low blood sugar, you can it, it's diagnostic to say it he has. He has a, a, so you'd say, A, there's a problem. B, there's low blood sugar, low, low blood sugar. And C, did he respond, or he or she respond to treatment with uh, some type of sugar? And if all three of those are in line and um, the, the response to that treatment was to correct the problem, then you probably have a, a uh, something going on where you need to look at either the pancreas uh, or the liver and see uh, where the the sugar metabolism problem is. And let's say the pancreas. The pancreas is in charge of insulin and glucagon. So if he's not secreting glucagon for some reason, um, you'd want to know that. On the other hand, if uh, he's if he's glucagon's work, pumping out and no, there's no response, then you want to look at the liver. Another possibility with low blood sugar. Um, now, you might be tempted to say something like uh, like diabetes, but diabetes would ha with, is high blood sugar. Another possibility with low blood sugar is um, high. Uh, so hyperinsulin. So so if you have too much insulin, that could be from an insulinoma. So some type of pancreatic cancer, insulinoma. And the last thing you could look at is like uh, fatty acid oxidation diseases and things related to that.